by implicit typing. So um, the syntax for an array it actually starts out with brackets. So um, this is why it was critical that when you create code blocks that you refer to those braces. Those brackets are what we're going to use for this. So to create an empty array, um, we can declare the type like this. So brackets um, and the type in between are the way that we designate the type of an array. And we can initialize it like this. So there's, a, there's an empty array that expects strings. So this is explicit type. This syntax on line 7 does exactly the same thing. But what we're doing is treating it as a type to be instantiated. So you'll notice the open and close paren syntax here, exactly like creating an object. So if that had been a class on the left hand, on the left of those parens, we would be instantiating an instance of whatever that class was. But in this case, we're creating an array with that syntax. So we have two arrays now, but they're both empty and they both expect strings. So, sorry, I found out the link. Implicit type. Uh, so what I'm going to do is we said non empty. So, here's an array with two elements in it, it's comma separated. But instead of declaring a type, I'm letting Swift infer the type from me because I gave it two strings. So it's going to believe that I want to create an array of strings. And it will always be an array of strings. Does that make sense? Because you put the bracket? The brackets mean I want an array. No, they the And then the double quotes mean that I'm reducing strings. So, and because both of these elements, so the first element of the array is hello, the second element of the array is doctor, they're both strings, and since a string is the only thing I put inside the array, it thinks it's an array of strings. If you put an integer in there, would it know yeah, it integer would, and string, or is there something else? It wouldn't treat it as an integer and string, it would treat it as an array of any object. Okay. Yeah, which is this way of it, kind of this fallback that it has when you, when you start mixing types together. Also a good question, because some languages actually keep track of that. Mm -hmm. Like the, the language that my last started had um, actually would keep track of the fact that you gave it strings and integers. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. So you only use paren after the implicit type of key, right? Only when you're just declaring type, you don't actually fill up. This is actually the same exact thing as this, but this one just happens to be empty. Right. So what I mean so, when it's empty, you need the parens at the end. Um, when it's yes, because oh. you're you're It's kind of the same as if I had a type. So this is just saying, like, oh, here's my type, which is, you know, array of string, and then give me one of them, but make it empty. Yeah. So it's a little bit weird, but just the syntax is a little bit lot different. All right, so let's, uh, let's access elements of the array. So um, the syntax for this for grabbing the first element is going to be brackets and then an integer which is which element of the array do you want to access. Remember we're zero indexed, so the first element of the array is going to be zero. I'm going to say like r2 sub zero for this, um, just like they say in, in math class, if you ever got to that level of math. So when I say sub zero that means brackets, and then the value zero inside. This is often referred to as a subscript. So in mathematics, that's when they write the little number down next to the letter. So it's just faster to say R2 sub zero to mean subscript zero. So it's like the function. I'm sorry? It's like a function. Nope, not a function at all. Nope. It's brackets, so it's a different syntax. And the accessing is completely different. And the color. Yeah, well, there are colors. But it just it just colorizes it to make things a little more legible. But I wouldn't trust it to uh, I wouldn't trust it to be giving you anything meaningful out of the colors. It's a um, reference, right? Where it is. It's a reference, that's 
actually throw an error. Um, if uh, I don't know why the playground is throwing an error here. Mine did. Did it? Mm -hmm. okay. you, have a, you have a real you have a real playground. <laughs> Mistakenly on the beta version, I think, mm -hmm. 631 or something, and um, it has not been treating me well. So it should give it should give an error. It's like out of bounds. Is that do you read, read the error out loud? Thank you. That's, that's fine. Who got, an, who got an error when you put sub two? No one. I did. It says execution was interrupted. Reason, execution, bad instruction, code equals exc, and then just uh, a bunch of numbers. Yeah, that's a different, that's a different kind of error. Mm. Um, so, the thing, to take, the thing to take note here is that it's not telling us nil here. So, if it, if it had actually told us nil, then it would have been telling us something interesting, which is, it would have, that all indices are valid, but we'll return nil as a value. This is actually not valid. So this is this is called being out of bounds. So String convertible is not convertible to range. Did you comment out the erroneous line about that? Yeah. yeah. If you're doing this R2 uh, thing, I didn't. No. Yeah. Comment it out. I, yeah. It's not there. Try it. You didn't do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Press enter. Try what? Press enter. So let me see if that function still works here. Okay. Mm. Do I just have a different version? Yes. It's not your fault though. Okay. So some of you get an error when you use count. Use the function count elements. to a student from the first um, the first uh, iteration of this course um, uh, earlier today, and he said that he's not using CocoaPods, which is this like repository of uh, open source contributed libraries, because of this problem. It's like they're continuing to change the language. It breaks everything that anyone contributes. So it's like the developers are like trying to keep up. Um, so we might run into a couple of these, um, but um, in any case, so whenever, maybe whenever you see count, me write count, you should think count elements instead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and then anyone else who's on the older, the older, older, I say older version in quotes, in air quotes, because it's like, it's not really older, it's probably the current one. I'm on the next one. Start thinking about in your mind. 
yeah. is the count of number of elements is different from the maximum index that you're allowed to use, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, if you were if you were using if you were using a while loop to iterate through every every piece of this, um, you'd have to use a less than <coughs> instead of less than sign instead of less than right? So, and the reason and the reason why they use zero instead is that it makes it a lot easier to do to do offsets like referencing like portions of inside an array like just by adding a number. So if I want to start the tenth, uh, yeah. tenth value of zero plus ten, and now I'm there. So I have two arrays, and I'm adding them together, and I just add a length of one to offset the whole thing. Yes. Mutates the array, actually changes it. So the same variable will now refer to the array with the same array with a chunk added to the end. So this method, insert, enables you to pick an index and play and insert that element into that index just by sticking it there. So you see hello is still here. So it said it found where index zero was, which was the first element of the array, and then pushed everything else to the side by one. You can change an element in an array just by using this equal syntax. So there, I just changed that first word just by saying R2 sub zero equals and then a string. Substitute. 
index of the word name in this, in this position. Index of the word name, Constantine, index of the word name. In this, in, on this one. Three. Three is an excellent. So therefore, if I say remove an index three, the word name is now gone. But that was hard for me. This one was? Yes. I know. I know this. I know this hard. Zero. That's why I asked you. We just have different arrays. It's okay. Why did it say? It says six. No, it doesn't say anything after four. Does it? I just got two. That's all I got. You got it. Which two? Uh, the quotes on the right. Right here? No, up here. Up here? No. Okay. Before, can you check it out?
only the word inside of the loop, but also the index that that word has in the array. You'll notice the, um, the parenthetical syntax here, which is something a little bit different. Index always refer back just back to like the most recent or like what if you have multiple arrays? Sorry, ask it again. So like index yes. that refers back to like the most recent array that you listed. No, index is an integer, which refers to the index of the element that you're iterating. That you're that you're iterating at that. So as I'm stepping through, I'm going discovery, hello, doctor, continue, yesterday. But, uh, but now in this loop, which is exactly the same in most ways as the loop on line 47, mm -hmm. but now I have zero discovery, one hello, two doctor, mm -hmm. three continue, yeah. four yesterday. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I, I guess so I'm saying. one array there. Yeah, but it's referring to like the A the A R R two because so like you could do that same thing, but for a different array. You oh, yeah. for a different oh array. yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. You can do the same thing for anyone. So, and then you can use whatever variable you want to there. Like index is here for legibility. Some people use i, some people use x, which I'm not like particularly. Okay. So these types of patterns are particularly useful when you have really complex operations that you want to do to a lot of different elements across, across the array. Um, the, um, I think that's good for now. I think I want to show how to sort and filter arrays. Um, you're going to need that. You're going to need that dimension. Sorting is super important. Um, and it starts to demonstrate the principle um, of passing functions as values, which I've never seen before. So, you notice that this array that we have, R2, discovery, hello, doctor, continue, is not an alphabetical order. Oftentimes you're going to get user input that is not in any order whatsoever. Um, it's at least um, computable. And sometimes you're going to want to change the order of that according to a particular logic. Um, alphabetical, reverse alphabetical, by price, by, by kind, etc. Et so, Arrays provide us with a dot sort method that we can use. Um, so the, and there are two ways. There are two ways to get at it, and the easy way is by using this global sort method. Before, on line 60, before the sort, the words are in not alphabetical order, and afterwards they're in alphabetical order. Continue discovery, doctor, hello, which way. They're like uh, logic to the ampersand. Yeah. So the ampersand, so arrays are passed by value. So if I pass an array from, like, into a function, I'm going to get a different array inside the function that I had outside of the function. Ampersand means pass by reference. So now, I'm, so now sort is actually has permission to manipulate the original array. Does that make sense? Can we get the first one? In, in. This is the same array. Yeah. And the sort function manip like changed the array. Actually changed all of my values. I can change the order of them. In the array. It's, it should be alphabetical. Is it not? Yeah. I think it's alphabetical. Right, so this is a peculiar syntax that you'll see when using this function. It's good for basic types. So it's good for arrays.
arrays of ints, arrays of doubles, arrays of uh, strings, arrays of floats. So the ampersand means alphabetical? No. Okay. The ampersand is not the alphabetical. The ampersand gives the function sort permission to manipulate that array. Um, so arrays are passed by what we call passed by value. So when the array goes into the function, on the, in the body of that function, it will be a different array than the array that I gave it, strangely enough. Um, so if I hadn't put the ampersand there and the function didn't require it, it would have sorted the array and it would have to have returned the value to me. But in this case, it actually mutated the array itself. It changed the array. It's kind of a weird way of doing it. Is there a way to do it like descending alphabetical order? Like, yeah, that's the, problem with this, that's the problem with this function. It doesn't give you a lot of control. You should be aware of it. The way that I actually recommend that you sort all the time is like this. Better sort. Why would you have to sort? Why would you have to sort? wanted to display a set of words alphabetically instead of randomly. If you had a list of people and you wanted to arrange them on in a table view by last name, you'd have to sort you'd have to sort the array that you put all the people in. So tell you this before, but strings also have comparative operators to find for them. So less than, greater than, less than, or equal to, etc. Or, e or double equals for quality. The way that Swift has that operator defined, at least the way that it's working for us right now, is that if those two strings are in alphabetical order, it will return true. If they're not in alphabetical order, it will return false. It's actually an alphanumeric order, because I think it includes punctuation What that function represents on line 66 is a rule about the relationship between two elements in the array. So given these two elements, it's asking which one, which order is correct. Is it A then B or B then A? That's the question that that function is intended to answer. Does that make sense? So if I do B, that then A then So let me show you what happens when I change the logic of that function. Once I pass it, once I say r to dot sort instead of a global sort function, I can hand it that that function alphabetical as a value as any other variable, and then the functions, then that function, that method of array sorts those values. If I wanted to go reverse alphabetical, like Sean just asked, I could reverse that condition, and now I have the reverse order. So this is what you're talking about with passing a function as a parameter? Or That's right. Parameter. As a value. Value. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The type of the function depends on that right there. The types of its arguments and its return type. So that is the, that is, it's called a function. It's called a type signature. That's what it's called, generally. And so in order, to, in order for that to make sense, it has to, those type signatures have to match up. Those A and B strings always, if you want to do this alphabetical, has to be A and B. Can it be C and D? It can be C and D. It doesn't matter. 
write what the names of these are. But the, what matters is these are strings. And it doesn't matter if because of the name, because of the utilitarian nature of this function, um, we generally always I I generally always use A and B because there's nothing else that identifies what those elements are because you don't know how the sort function is actually using that that function. You see, it's called eight times. Kind of curious. But the, the type is dependent on the type of the array. So if there was an array of numbers, it would be int. That's right. Yeah. So if we say numbers, So this is actually probably clearer. Um, the increasing function returns true if b is greater than a. And then the sort function magically uses that piece of logic to figure out what the order should be for all of those elements in the array. So all we have to do conveniently is just tell it the relationship between two elements, two generic elements. Tell me which one should go next. So it's true if. So if you get A and B and it's true, that means B goes next. This is, this is what we want for an increasing logic. For a decreasing logic, we want the opposite. We want to tell it that B goes left of A. And it just knows to apply that logic to like every um, like instance of the array. So you don't need to write like A, B, C, D, E, That's right. yeah, yeah. number. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you don't have to write them all out, which is really nice. Um, and so there's a whole there's a whole like cult of computer science around sorting and how efficient sorting can be and how, how inefficient it is and what different techniques are. We don't have to we don't have to worry about it. Technically you do if you have tons and tons of data and you're trying to sort really fast and all that stuff. But for us, we're going to be dealing with small amounts of data. So these are two great utility functions to have while you're Increasing and decreasing. If you want to, if you want to sort stuff, where it becomes really interesting is when you're not just when you don't have arrays of just simple objects like instant, instant floats and and strings, but when you have full-fledged objects that you've defined, like a, like a dog. So. So if you have if you have a class if you have a class dog lying around from a previous playground, go grab it, just copy it and paste it.
So, if I were to create an array of dogs, how would I do? Does everyone catch up to me? Single initializer that accepts a name and initializes the parameter name it has one method bark, which returns a string. We don't like print line playgrounds because print line sucks. So you'd have to like put in like Shiba, like a different types of dogs inside the brackets. Well, if I'm talking about types right now, mm -hmm. not values or instances. And I just created a class called Dog. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to create an array of those, what do you think I should put? Inside, inside dog. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So it seems 
identifier of dogs, but I get the same This should be a this should be right there. This, this makes it an array, yeah. Okay. And because, because it's typed, because it's explicitly typed, I don't need to tell it what the type is on the other side of the equal sign. So it just assumes that I mean an empty array of dog. But so you can mean an equal right? You definitely need, yeah, you definitely need that. Because if you do this, then it's just going to say, like, it's not initialized. Right. You see, passed by reference before being initialized. So you definitely have to initialize it. 